you know, it's not a gift until you use it for God. And so I'm thankful that our talented musicians and singers are using their gifts for God and to glorify the name of Jesus Christ and to bless the people of Jesus Christ, his church. I uh, wanted to continue in the book of Joshua today and just have a couple of minor points, uh, well, not minor points, but they're things that are tucked in amongst the land grants and the families and tribes that are given and who gets what and where those borders extend. And if anyone was really hoping beyond hope that I would preach through the genealogies and the land grants, I apologize. I, I, I beg your forgiveness, but we're just going to get to the meat of it and ask God to bless uh, the things that he tucked in there. And I believe it's for a reason. Uh, the scripture says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And there's a reason those things are in there. Uh, and uh, although I'm not going to touch on them now because I'm not even sure, other than to let us know that God is intimately familiar uh, and, 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 and intimately knowledgeable of even the most minute details in our lives, and I'm, I'm blessed by that, that he knows the very numbers of hairs on our head, that he knows when one, a single sparrow falls to the ground, that the, field, the lilies of the field are clothed, in more majesty, beauty, and splendor than King Solomon was ever arrayed. I'm thankful that God is, even down to the smallest and most seemingly insignificant details of our lives, is intimately knowledgeable and knows you and me what a blessing and privilege that is. And then, in these genealogies and these, uh, and these land grants, he's tucked in uh, things that have to do with doctrine and how to live as Christians and, and, and who God is, uh, theology we call that, the, the study and the discussion of the nature of who God is. And so I'm blessed that God put these things in here for us. And I'll begin in Joshua chapter 15. Joshua chapter 15 and verse 13. And we remember last week that Caleb was one of the two spies, two out of 12 spies, including Caleb and Joshua, gave a good report of the land of Canaan. Now, I shouldn't say of the land of Canaan. They all said the land of Canaan was amazing, but only two of them said that with God's power, might, and help, we can take the land. The rest of them said it's got giants. The cities are walled and fortified. The land swallows up its inhabitants. Let's just turn around and go back to Egypt. But because they gave a good and a faithful report to the people, Joshua and Caleb were two of that generation that were permitted to cross the Jordan River into the uh, Promised Land 40 years after uh, they first came to its gates. And then Caleb came to Joshua uh, in chapter 14 and reminded Joshua, remember what God told you and me, that we would inherit and we would possess this land with the younger people. And then he said, I am well able to take it. I am strong in the Lord. At 85 years old, I'm just as strong as I was at 40. At 85 years old, I trust God just as much as I did at 40. At 85 years old, I'm just as able to go up and take possession of the things God has promised me as I was at 40. And Joshua blessed him and gave him his possession and his inheritance. And it says in chapter 15, verse 13, and unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which city is Hebron. Now remember, whenever you see Anak, we're talking about giants. We're talking about the mighty men of renown, the men of old, uh, uh, the, the, the superheroes, if you will, of the old days. Only these were the people that opposed God. You know, modern-day superhero movies make them look like saviors. They're actually antichrists, the, the, the real men of renown and of old. And uh, they were uh, 12, 13, 14 feet tall, had six fingers and six toes on each, uh, on each limb. And Goliath, at uh, about 10 feet tall, was actually pretty small, pretty puny by giant standards. The ones that came before him were much, much bigger. And so he went in, and he took uh, the city of Hebron, and Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, uh, Shishai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Debir. The name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kirjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Oxa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and gave him to Oxa, his daughter, 
to wife. And it came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she lighted off her ass. And Caleb said unto her, What wouldst thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing, for thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And we've preached on this before about how the upper springs represent the eternal spiritual blessings of God, uh, the ones that flow through his Holy Spirit and to us. This is the river of life. This is the spring bubbling up unto eternal life that pours out of us that Jesus, prof that, uh, Jesus uh, promised would come upon uh, those who believe on him. And this is the upper springs. And then the nether springs would be things that would help us to serve God in a temporal sense. God gives us a heart for kids so he, uh, as an upper spring. So as another spring, he gives us a place where we can meet together and have youth meetings. God gives us a heart for those who don't have transportation to get to church. So perhaps God's going to give us uh, a, a carpool ministry or some kind of a bus ministry as a lower spring to carry out on earth what he get, what, what's on his heart in heaven. We've talked about that, but I want to focus on the fact that Caleb uh, called for someone, anyone, who was able to smite Kirjath Sefer and said to him, I'll give, uh, I'll give my daughter to wife. And this is... Um, this is a little bit of pulling back the curtain of eternity and a little bit of interpolation uh, on, your, on your preacher's part this morning because it doesn't explicitly say uh, that this conversation happened, but we, we know the end of the conversation did happen because it's recorded in the book of Psalms. And so we know that God called out Abraham to leave his family and his people from Ur of the Chaldees and come out to a place where God would show him. God didn't tell him what the destiny, what the destination was. He just said, take that first step and get out. And so Abraham packed up, and his uh, nephew Lot wanted to come along. He wanted to be faithful to the God of heaven, and he wanted to be faithful to his uncle Abraham. And so he came along, and they left, not knowing where God would take them. And, and God, through Abraham, and through Isaac, and through Jacob, and through the sons of Jacob, espoused himself to a nation, the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament is called God's wife. That transaction has already happened, and through the covenant he made with Abraham, and through the covenant he made with Jacob, and through the covenant he made with Moses and the people at Mount Sinai, God had espoused and, and, and uh, wed himself to that nation, to the nation of Israel. And so we can imagine that the redemption price for the nation of Israel was... A, a spotless and sinless and perfect sacrifice. We saw that with the Feast of Passover. And we knew from eternity past that that spotless, sinless, and perfect sacrifice without spot or blemish was going to be God's only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, prophesied in Genesis 3.15 and on through the Scriptures that the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. And, and uh, we, we saw that culminate with the cross of Jesus Christ where he who, was without no, uh, who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And uh, you can imagine when God the Father espoused himself to the nation of Israel and Jesus might have said something like, well, Father, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to lay my life down to purchase this nation, to redeem this nation, to reconcile this people to you. And I'm just wondering if I can't get something for me in the process of laying down my life, of making myself a ransom. And, and God the Father turned to him, and it says this in Psalms, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And that heathen is us, gathered here this morning. Now I know that grates on our senses. I know we think that we're just so amazing that God had no choice but to send Jesus to die for us, but it turns out we're just a bunch of heathen. And it turns out that we don't know why, but through John 3.16, we know that God so loved the heathen, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And just like that story recorded in Scripture where God turns to his Son and says, if you want it, you can, through your death on the cross, purchase yourself a bride. I, the Father, have the nation of Israel. She is my wife. If you want a bride of your own, you can have everyone else. And today, God commands all of us to repent through faith and, and trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And we are the heathen bride that Christ purchased 
uh, in addition to reconciling the people of Abraham, the nation of Israel, to, to his father. And so Caleb said, if anyone will smite this city, I will give him my daughter to wife. Well, it just so happens that as many as received him, it says in John chapter 1, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so uh, this, this woman was, was made a daughter through the transaction or through the, through the conquering sacrifice of her husband. And the first time that she wanted something from Caleb, her father, she had to go through her husband, the conqueror, the champion. And she moved him to ask of Caleb for a field. And then it changes. And the father starts talking directly to the daughter. Now, if you and I are sinners, if we are heathen in need of salvation, do not walk, do not look, do not stand, do not think about it. Run directly to Jesus Christ. Get to him as fast as you can. Because as Job cried out, Oh, that there was a daysman betwixt me and God who could bring us together in agreement. There is only one person ever who is qualified to literally lay hands on God the Father because he is God in very nature and then lay hands on you and me because he is man by very nature. And that's really nice of them to quiet down. All right. And then... As a man lay hands on us, as the Son of God, as the eternal uh, Word of God lay hands on God and bring us together and bridge that gap and, bring, and get us down to the table to, to, as the Scripture says, let us reason together. Until Jesus stepped on the scene, there was no way for God to approach us because we're sinful or for us to approach God because He's holy. But someone who is fully man and fully God laid down his life, paid the, paid the penalty, paid the cost, paid the price to God, not to Satan as is so often, uh, you know, I think blasphemously uh, taught. Jesus did not pay a ransom to get us back from the devil. He paid the ransom to his father because his father needed to be able to forgive our sin. And the only way to do that was through the perfect shed blood. And so he paid that ransom, and he can lay hands on God and lay hands on you and me and bring us together in agreement. And then it says in 1 John that there are little children who know God, that there are young men who have overcome the wicked one, and then there are fathers who have known the Father, the Heavenly Father. And as we mature as Christians, and don't get, you know, this whole thing about the, the people in the world say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. And then they'll go on to say something like, well, I pray to God every day, but I don't know about this Jesus fella. Well, if you're not talking to Jesus first, you're never getting to the Father. Uh, you, you do not have uh, an end around to talk to God. It goes through Jesus. And remember that Caleb's daughter had to talk through her husband, through the champion, through the conqueror to get to him first. But after that, she stopped talking through the, the, uh, the husband, uh, champion, and conqueror, and she started talking directly to her father. And as you and I grow in maturity and grace as Christians, what we do is, uh, you know, initially as believers, as children of God, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. He, he, he laid down his life. He became man. He humbled himself. He sacrificed himself. He's the champion. He's the binder of the strong man. He's the spoiler of the strong man's house. It's Jesus always, Jesus only, Jesus. And what he does as we grow in grace and maturity as Christians is he takes us into the presence of his Father and we become uh, more confident in talking and to and knowing God as our Father. And I pray today that those of us who, uh, none of us had a perfect Father, uh, but some of us never knew our fathers and some of us wish we had never known our fathers. And I pray this morning that God would set us free of the, of the entanglements of, of imperfect people uh, and that clouding our view and that uh, uh, clouding our vision of God as the perfect and gracious and loving Heavenly Father, the bestower of all good things, the benevolent and loving kind Heavenly Father, the authoritative, yes, Heavenly Father, the correcting, yes, Heavenly Father, uh, the one who tells us no sometimes and stop there and don't go any further, but the one who, when we're down, picks us up and dusts us off and helps us to get back up on our way, the encouraging 
Father. And I pray that uh, if any of us, if our minds and our hearts are bound by past experiences this side of heaven, that God would set us free in the spirit and in the mind and the heart to receive and believe and commune with Him as the greatest Father that mankind has ever known. And I pray for our dads here today uh, and, and even our mothers here today to commune with their children and treat their children as their Heavenly Father blesses and deals with them, uh, to be informed in that relationship. Okay, so you go to the Father through the Son first, and then once that relationship is established, then Jesus says, now you and my Father can, t can do business and talk directly. As you grow, as you mature, as you strengthen in your faith and in your walk, your relationship is established and, 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 and deepened with the Heavenly Father. And by the way, Jesus never goes away. I will never stop admiring Jesus. I will never stop praising and glorifying Jesus. I will never stop giving Him the honor and the worship to whom uh, that to only the uh, Almighty God is due because Jesus Christ is in fact Almighty God. But He says, don't stop there. I've got more for you. I want you to know my Father. And then I get to call Jesus' Father, my Father. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I, I hope someone's blessed this morning as we consider that God is our Father. Now, to wrap up, to wrap up, and this doesn't have much to do one with the other, but it's just another point that I saw as I read through the Scripture. In Joshua chapter 22, Joshua chapter 22, it's time for the Reubenites, the Gadites, and part of Manasseh to get back across the Jordan River to the far side. And I'll paraphrase the story for time's sake and because it's tough to flip through the scriptures with one hand and hold the microphone with the other. What they did was, when they first came up to the Jordan River, before they ever crossed in and, and faced Jericho or anything, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half-tribe of Manasseh said to Moses, this side of the Jordan is just good enough for us. We're happy to stay here. And what Moses said is, if you insist on staying on this side, now this was not God's original plan, but he will bless you, he will establish you, he will give you a, a peace and, and, and a hope and a future here, but you need to send your men of war across the river and help the other ten tribes conquer that side of the river. So what you can do is you can set up tents here and your, and your wives and your children and your, and your livestock may stay here, but anyone who can bear a sword, anyone who can hold a shield, anyone who can draw a bow and sling an arrow through the sky needs to go across and fight uh, so, and take the promised land on that side of the river. And they did it. Bless God, they said they would, and they actually did. How many times do you and I start out for something and then don't quite get done with it for God? They finished it. And then they came to Joshua and said, is it okay if we go back across the river and live where, where Moses told us that we could, uh, could establish our homes? And Joshua says, you did it. You helped us fight. You marched with us. You fought with us. You helped to uh, drive out the inhabitants of the land. Uh, it, 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 it's well, we've taken what God has promised to us, and we've, we've finished the job, and so you can go back across the river, and you can live peaceably where Moses uh, promised that you could stay. And so they do, but when they get there, they build an altar. And the people of Israel hear that the Reubenites, Gadites, and the, people, and the tribe of Manasseh is building an altar on the far side of the river, and so they come dressed for war. Because there's only one place of sacrifice. There's only one place in, uh, in the land where blood is shed. There's only one place in the land where men and women are reconciled to Almighty God, and that's in the tabernacle. And that's where the peace offerings are made, the sin offerings are made, the, uh, the offerings of thanksgiving are made. That's where the sacrifice of atonement is made on that high holy day in the year. Uh, this, is, uh, this altar on the far side is a place of idolatry. It's a place of, 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 uh, uh, of, of false worship. And so what the, uh, the ten tribes come over, and they're dressed for war, and they're ready to go. And the Scripture tells us that if a man answereth a matter before he heareth, it is a shame and a folly unto him. So they give the Reubenites, Gadites, and Manassites the, the benefit of the doubt and say, what in the world are you doing building this altar over here? 
and what they said satisfied the nation of Israel. They said, we're not going to perform sacrifices on this altar. We're just going to have it as a remembrance of the altar, of the true altar, of the real altar, of the altar where reconciliation is made, of the altar where the blood is shed, of the altar where peace offerings are uh, given to God. And they said, we're not going to do anything with this. We're not going to worship. We're not going to sacrifice. We're not going to burn. This is just going to be a, a, a reminder to us of the real altar that exists across the river. And so on our steeple, we have a cross, a place of sacrifice that is not the uh, place of sacrifice. That's not the cross of Jesus Christ. That is there to remind us of the real cross and place of sacrifice and place where the blood was shed of Jesus Christ. But you know what happens over time? The Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh do become distant and separated from the rest of the nation, partially from geography. They're across the river. And second, because they have a bloodless altar amongst them. And you and I as Christians need to carefully consider where our heart is in relation to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and carefully consider if we've begun to make the cross a bloodless cross and begun to make the atonement a bloodless atonement and begun to make our lives as Christians lives without sacrifice. The cross of Jesus Christ was brutal, bloody. From a human standpoint, it was disgusting. Jesus looked, it says in Isaiah, that his visage was marred beyond that of any other man. Jesus looked like a piece of meat hanging on the cross. It was hideous. And you and I would do well to get back to that place where the, the only begotten Son of God gave himself spirit, soul, and body for our redemption and where real drops of blood fell to the ground. Uh, first, most possibly in the... Um, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed in earnest, his, his, uh, his spirit was uh, uh, crushed unto death almost, and, he, and he, it said he uh, sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, and then continuing as they lashed his back with the, with the Roman soldiers' cat and nine tails, and it continued as they took a crown of thorns and pressed it deep into his skull, and it continued as they beat him with rods and beat him with their fists and plucked out his beard and pulled out his hair, and it continued on that long, uh, mile-long walk from the praetorium of Caesar, uh, uh, not Caesar, but the Pilate, to the place of the skull, and then it continued as they drove those nails into his hands and feet, and he hung there and agony of spirit and body for three torturous hours and then it continued after he died where the Roman soldier to confirm he was dead thrust his spear up through the rib cage and blood and water came out confirming that in fact yes the only begotten son of God has died and shed every drop of his blood for us and the epistle from, uh, from, from the apostle Peter warns us as believers that we have not yet resisted unto blood. Uh, we've, we've gotten pretty comfortable with a Christian life that does not require sacrifice. And uh, as, as Teresa mentioned, tomorrow is the day of the Christian martyr, and we're going to mark people that have given their lives, that have shed their very blood for their, for their witness, their faith, and their love of their Savior. And we're going to mark people who have shed their blood and been shackled and thrown in dark prisons. And we're going to mark people that have been in dark prisons and shed their blood and been released. And just as John Bunyan said, if you let me out of this prison cell today, I'll be out preaching in the streets tomorrow. And they have not compromised or they have not uh, uh, worn down their Christian witness. In fact, they're emerging from those prison cells with a stronger and more vibrant faith and a louder witness than they ever had before. And here's the thing. Paul said that when I am made a partaker of the sufferings of Christ, that I became a, become a partaker of his death, his crucifixion, that then I can know the power of his resurrection. And a lot of Christians today, I would say, we live a powerless Christian life, not because the Holy Spirit is not available, not because God's not still on the throne, and not because God doesn't want great things for his people and his church, 
but because we haven't uh, gone to the cross with Jesus daily. Paul said, I die daily, and something in me has to die, whether it be my fear of man, whether it be my love of pleasure, whether it be my, my enjoyment of comfort rather than going out on a limb for Jesus, whatever it is, something in me has to die every day so that then I can know the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. And so without the cross, there's no empty tomb. Without the sacrifice, there's no life, there's no power in my walk with Christ. And I pray that God would, would enable us in this time. We were just remarking in our, our earlier prayer group this morning, we are free now to worship as we will, to preach as we will, to serve as we will, to post whatever we will on social media, to gather and assemble peaceably in public, uh, to proclaim and worship the name of Jesus Christ. We are free to do all those things. And how much more should we be doing those things now boldly and even sacrificially if it costs us friends, if it costs us uh, prestige in the community, if it costs us money at the job, if we don't get that promotion because they say we're a Jesus freak and I need someone who's going to cut corners to be my district manager. I don't need someone who's honest and following after Jesus. Whatever it costs us, if we would be willing to make that sacrifice, we would then have the resurrection power of Christ at work in our lives. And it's one thing to be saved and on your way to heaven. It's another thing to look like a child of God empowered by his Holy Spirit and the only way to get there is to get back to the altar of sacrifice and even if need be resist unto blood so I pray that today when our lives are not being called for we will be bold witnesses for him and we will put ourselves on the cross and I pray that if, if sometime in the future that we our lives are demanded and someone else decides they're gonna put us on the cross that we will be bold witnesses then and enjoy and experience and rejoice in the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ. I'll invite the, uh, amen, amen.